Phi Beta Kappa specifically asks the, those of us who are lecturing for them to address our remarks to the students. And so um, the, I pitched my lecture to a student audience, even though the students are not in the majority. Uh, oh, hi. <laughs> uh, so I'll just talk to you guys up there. Um, and uh, I, I gave a talk in California and was talking about the students. And then at the end of the talk, a bunch of faculty asked the first questions. And then afterwards, someone emailed me and said, students really should ask the first questions. So OK, guys, you're going to start the Q&A. Uh, uh, so tonight, I'm going to talk about um, the Silk Road, A New History. And I want to start with a map the, uh, just to tell you where I'm talking about. I, I, I feel free to move. Though, I mean, the, I, I've, the setup, the AV setup isn't perfect with the slides. And there's certainly seats closer to the slides. And you can move your chairs closer um, because a lot of the talk is about images. And um, the Silk Road, I'll be explaining to you that I don't think the Silk Road connected China with Rome. And the part of the Silk Road that I'll be talking about tonight is mostly the northern route around the Taklamakan and then also the southern route. Uh, the Chinese capital is off the map over here. And then the route moves um, west into probably, I think, well, this is a good map here, the inset map. Uh, I gave a, I've been giving talks on the Silk Road for a long time, and one time somebody in the audience came up and said, you must show us the ocean. We have no way of knowing where you are if you don't show us the ocean. So the purpose of uh, this sliver here is to, no, this map here, is to just give you a sense of where we are. The, uh, and I'm, as a historian, particularly interested in how materials that archaeologists have found documents that have come out of the ground can uh, expand on our understanding of the past as we know it from other more established sources. And his, all historians are always interested in what conditions, under what conditions were a given source uh, produced. And um, I'll be talking a lot tonight about a distinction that a French historian named Marc Bloch made. He died in the resistance um, in 1945. The, and Marc Bloch was a medieval European historian and he drew a distinction between intentional sources that a historian sits down and writes, like a chronicle, versus a non-intentional source, which is just a scrap of paper that somebody may have written something on. Or, or uh, I mean, an unintentional source can be any, it doesn't have to be on a piece of paper. Uh, and because the Silk Road climate is so dry, we have a lot of materials that have been preserved that don't survive from other parts um, I was going to say of China, but really of Asia or Eurasia. And the documents that come out of the ground are sometimes intentionally placed there. If people were living in a village, say, and they knew that they had to leave because the village was attacked, they might bury uh, the documents in a specific place, hoping to come back to them. But most of the materials that archaeologists find are unintentional, that they're just thrown away and then they're covered up with dirt, or they're in a garbage pit, and then they survive to um, the present. And this is an outline of today's talk that I'll keep coming back to all these points. But basically, the old view of the Silk Road trade is that Romans used coins to buy Chinese silk. At the beginning of the talk, I'll explain why I don't think that's true. And then I'm going to add a third variable, so silk, coins, and paper and talk about why paper is so important and how paper moves, it's invented first in China, how paper moves out of China along the Silk Road into Central Asia. The first person to use the word Silk Road was a German geographer, and this is a picture of him, Ferdinand von Richthofen. He's the, uh, the, the famous Red Baron from World War I, was his nephew, and um, von Richthofen, so, when I say he coined the word Silk Road, I mean that nobody living in the past used that term for any route. So nobody in China ever called anything the Silk Road. Nobody, I mean, it's a, a modern, well, modern, 1877, the students are rolling their eyes, um, a pre-modern term, um, a pre-modern term applied to the ancient past. 
And um, von Richthofen made a five volume atlas of China and drew one of the maps in this huge atlas showed the Silk Road. And you can, um, you can see it, I've highlighted it here um, in red. On the original map, it was a much thinner line. And um, von Richthofen, one of the things that he was tasked with doing was to um, plot a line to connect, to build a railway line connecting Germany with China. And I think that influenced his idea about the Silk Road, that he thought of it as a single line and not as a variety of routes. Uh, and so the view that he, he took, which I think was informed by his reading in classical sources, was that the Romans spent money, uh, coins, to buy Chinese silks. And the most famous classical writer to write about silk is Pliny the Elder. And Pliny the Elder says different things about silk in different places. So in one place, he knows about silkworms. But in another place, he thinks silk is a plant byproduct. It's like a white fuzz that grows on leaves. And Pliny was extremely irritated that the Romans were spending so much money on silk, especially because it was transparent. You know, if you're going to waste your money on something, it shouldn't be, why, why waste it on transparent cloth? Okay? And um, he also railed against other goods that were imported, like frankincense and amber, tortoise shell. Um, these were all luxury commodities that Pliny felt the Romans were spending their money on and were weakening um, Rome by doing that. And the, are, there are a couple problems with his view. The first thing is that the Roman government didn't collect any trade statistics, so we have no idea how much they imported of any of these goods. Um, the second thing is that if the Romans had bought a lot of Chinese silk, you would expect to find a lot of Chinese, sorry, a lot of Roman coins in China. And in fact, you don't. These are the earliest Roman coins found in China. They're from the, five, the early sixth century. And they're so much, you know, 500 years after Pliny. And you can see the holes on the side. They were sewn onto clothing. This is true of the different Roman coins found in China. Um, many of them have these holes. They were sewn onto clothing as a talisman to keep, to, maybe for good luck, or to keep illness away. So they weren't used as money. Uh, and there are about 50 of them total, Roman coins found in China in this later period. There are many more coins, over 1,000 coins found from Iran. These are, this is a Sasanian silver coin, and the Sasanian coins have a portrait of, the, of a given emperor. Each emperor has a unique um, crown, like an iconographically unique crown, so you can identify him. And then on the back is the Iranians were Zoroastrians, so there's a fire altar in the center, and then these are two priests feeding the fire altar in the middle. So the coin evidence suggests that China had much more trade with the Iranian world than with the Roman world. And that's consonant with a lot of the information that we have. And this is a very blurry slide that I took myself um, at a museum where they have very old fragments of silk from 3000 BC. We, we all know that the Chinese made silk before anyone else. That's true. But other parts of the world also were making silk very early. Silk has been found in ancient India in 2500 BC. And um, it's also been found, there was an island in the Aegean called Kos that produced silk. And so maybe the silk that Pliny was complaining about wasn't Chinese silk. We don't know if it was Chinese silk or not. Uh, and so basically, I, at this point, I want you to think, OK, maybe the Romans did not buy Chinese silk with their coins. I will explain to you what I think did happen. And I want to talk about paper. And one of my questions for the students is, uh, what's more important, paper or silk, as in terms of historical significance? Paper? No, hand, no, no need to discuss this? Totally obvious? OK. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I sometimes give this talk. One time I gave this talk, and I was wearing a silk jacket. I'm like, okay, silk doesn't matter, and I took my jacket off, and my son, who was 11 and dragooned into being there, was like, why did you take your jacket off? 
What was the, <laughs> the point being textiles, there are other textiles, right? I mean, there are other textiles besides silk, but there's no writing material as good as paper. There are alternate writing materials, but nothing as durable um, and as cheap as paper. So um, I'm going to talk now, the first place I'm going to be talking about is a site called Xuan Xuan, and you can see where it is, it's actually right there, very close to Dunhuang. And I'm interested in Xuan Xuan because you can see the Chinese, you can see how paper was first, how it was first used when it was initially discovered. And the Xuan Xuan site has produced um, many, many um, wooden slips with writing on them. And this is what the Chinese used as a writing material before paper. They also used silk, but um, this was the primary writing material and they tied them together. Uh, and from this one site, there are 35,000 of these wooden slips and about 2,000 of them are dated. And these are, uh, this is a scientifically excavated site. So we can see the layers um, when of, of use. It was a garbage pit. So it's a good example of what Mark Bloch would call non-intentional materials. And you can see that, so there's a lot of wooden documents and then 10 documents on silk and 10 documents on paper. And this is one of the earliest ones. It's, so this is about 100 BC, and you can see there's writing here. This is the Chinese name of a drug. And you can see that the paper was crumpled because it was used as packaging for the drug. The drug was a powdered drug and then placed in the paper and squished together. And the archeological evidence we have about the first use of paper is that it was used primarily as a wrapping material. So we have examples of bronze mirrors that were wrapped in paper and then placed in um, another container. And paper also had the ability, I mean, nowadays it's hard to imagine buying a pair of shoes maybe with paper in it, but um, it does, paper does have the ability to hold the shape of something. So it's a very useful material for wrapping. The, uh, I just want to point out, because this sometimes comes up in this lecture, that if the, we have archaeological evidence of paper from the second century BC, that means that the legendary inventor of paper in China did not invent paper. Okay, paper long predated Thailand. Uh, so it, at Xuan Xuan, we can see uh, multiple layers. And what you can see at Xuan Xuan is that paper gradually comes into use as a writing material. And by about the year 300, there's one example of a letter. And that's about the date in central China that people were using paper as a writing material for letters and other things. So um, the, uh, and I already said this, it's a, there, the Xuan Xuan paper is a good example of an unintentional source. Now, when we look at what's written on the Xuan Xuan materials, not on the paper documents, but on these wooden slips, there are records of envoys coming from outside of China and on their way into China to visit the Chinese emperor in the Chinese capital, which was farther inland. And the um, Xuan Xuan was a postal station. People changed horses there, these envoys coming into China. And they stayed the night and they ate food. And the soldiers who were in that garrison wrote down how much food the guests ate so that they could be reimbursed. So this tells us the, that some of the people traveling in this early period on the Silk Road were emissaries or envoys sent by one king to another king. And some of those envoys are trading on the side. These documents mention private horses. So those are non-state horses that the envoys are bringing in themselves and maybe hope to sell. And so there's always a blurry line with these people traveling on the Silk Road that their primary purpose in travel may not be trade, but some of them are engaged in trade. And you can see that in this early period. The second period is in the third and fourth centuries. And this is when we can see the first interactions between people of different cultures. And the, um, there are a couple sites on the Southern Silk Road that I'll be talking about, um, Nia and Lolan. And the archeologist who did the most work at these sites was a Hungarian named Oral Stein who 
later became a British citizen. And this is a picture he took at Nia. You can see it's, we're in the middle of the desert. It, it, historically, it was wetter. There was a river there that dried up. Um, but the, this carving has, is covered with Indian motifs. And the local people wrote documents on wood using a script from India. So it's most likely that they came into what is now China, now, now Northwest China, Xinjiang, from um, Northwest India, from the Gandhara region. And Stein noticed that some of the materials were deliberately placed in the ground, so these were intentional sources placed there, presumably that the, when people left the village they thought they would go back, but they never were able to, and he found these materials at the beginning of the, um, in the early 1900s. And this is a kind of typical Nia document. It's got this script on it, which is called Karoshti, and then it's got two seals on it, and one of them has Chinese characters, and one of them has a kind of Greek-looking face. I'm sure it's hard for you to see in the back. I'm sorry about that. But the, because the, these migrants to the Nia site came from the Gandhara region, that's where Alexander the Great had been, and the descendants of his soldiers lived there, and they used these kind of Greek-type seals um, to seal um, documents. And the, there's no paper yet. This is the third and fourth centuries, uh, but we're farther to the west. Paper has not yet moved out there. And so people had this very ingenious system of documents of two pieces of wood that they tied together and then sealed. And they wrote the contents of the document on the outside. And if you look at these materials, there are over a thousand documents from this site. They have hardly anything to say about trade. It's a local subsistence economy. Most of the people are raising animals and they're using grain and sometimes um, cloth to, as a, a currency to exchange different things. The, um, but there are two reports that, of people who were robbed when they were in this village and they went to the police to report what had been stolen. And some of those goods sound like Silk Road goods, like pearls. Pearls in the ancient world came from Sri Lanka. So from, for the pearls to have traveled up to Nia uh, is, uh, shows you that um, I think one of the goods that did travel overland was small, lightweight jewels. Because they were easy to carry. One of the big issues about carrying things long distance is just transport costs. Uh, and how, I mean, it was so hard to carry anything heavy over such a long distance. And when you look at these documents, so you see that people are exchanging grain or cloth for animals, also children, there's a sale of people. Uh, and then the main people who are using gold and silver are emissaries. So again, we see emissaries moving um, through this small village on their way to other places. And the emissaries are the most documented travelers on the Silk Road. That would probably be true today also. I think that if you thought about um, bureaucrats traveling around, that they would have to report every expense, that they might generate a lot more documents than somebody who's just traveling on their own and doesn't, get, doesn't have to fill in an expense report. The, uh, so this is the only example we have of silk that was used as money the only archaeologically recovered example of silk that was used at money. It dates to the um, third or fourth centuries. It was originally one bolt of silk. It should have been photographed with the bolts connected. Um, they look sort of golden, but they were originally white, and they were, it's a plain, it's called a plain silk. It's a basket weave silk, so there's no special um, weaving techniques used. And a bolt of silk, the Chinese stipulated the length of a bolt of silk that could be used as money, and it was often around 40 Chinese feet, so a little bit less than um, 40 feet modern English feet, like maybe 38. Uh, and um, what von Richthofen didn't know was that silk was money also. So in this idea that the Romans used coins to buy silk, um, he didn't realize that the Chinese were using silk especially when they didn't have enough coins, and they almost always had a shortage of coins. So, um, and that's something we can see in the documents, is the use of silk uh, as a currency. And silk has certain advantages over coins. 
I th when I give this talk, people are often, I, I think we live in a world where, well, we're so used to plastic or paper money or coins, it's hard to think of other things as currency, but coins are very heavy. Silk was lighter than the coins. The coins were more durable, but the silk held pretty well. It was a, you know, if you, if you just used a bolt of silk and, and carried it from one place to the other, it, it didn't age that much, so it held its value. That, um, now I want to talk about one very unusual group of documents that Stein found in this place here. He found it in, uh, basically it was in the middle of the desert. There was a series of watchtowers that the military used, the Chinese soldiers used, and they would um, light a flame. They used torches to send signals if and somebody was invading. And um, Stein found a ma an abandoned mailbag that had eight letters in it. And they're unusual Silk Road documents because they're actually by merchants, some of them. Um, and you can see that the envelopes were written, these are, this is a, an address written on burlap, but the letters themselves were written on paper. And um, what's interesting is that there are f um, eight letters and they were written, so they were written in a language called Sogdian, and Sogdian was the language of a group of people who lived in modern Samarkand, which is in Uzbekistan. It's related to Middle, Middle Persian, and the Sogdians were one of the most important Silk Road, I mean, they were the most important Silk Road traders. And some of these letters describe um, a merchant who's traveling in China and the different goods he has, and he's writing back to his boss, telling him what he's managed to sell and what he's still carrying. And what's interesting about that, and I was gonna say that there are about, I don't know, maybe 10 people in the world who can read Sogdian in the original. Uh, I'm not one of them. Uh, luckily for me, they're all very generous, and uh, they would try to help me. They fight, I mean, every once in a while, they, I was gonna say they fight with each other about what every word means, and every once in a while, somebody has a breakthrough, and then the other nine people will be like, oh yeah, you might be right about that. Um, and so one, one of the debates is, there's just the Sogdian word for white is listed as one of the commodities that this man is writing to his boss about, and um, it seems most likely that it was a cosmetic with a lead base, maybe not that good for your skin, um, <laughs> or that good for you. Uh, but anyway, so pepper, silver, musk, again, these are all small, lightweight goods, right, that makes sense that someone is carrying across um, a desert that's punctuated by oases. The um, third phase, that I'll be talking about is um, from about 500 to 800, and I would call this the high point of the Silk Road trade, or at least the pre-Islamic period of the Silk Road trade, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, and I'll be talking mostly, but now I'm gonna be talking about Turfan, uh, which is a site um, in, uh, I was gonna say that if you read The Lonely Planet, it recommends going to Turfan because it's really hot in Turfan, and so, this, I took this picture. This is just the streets in downtown Turfan, and it's a grape arbor. Uh, and people in Turfan plant grapes and melons, and then in August, when it's really hot, like 130 or 140 degrees, everybody sits around eating these grapes and melons. And the Lonely Planet thinks that's one of the most fun things you can do in China. Uh, the, uh, so, but that climate is very advantageous for those of us who are interested in what's preserved by um, what remains archaeologically. Um, this is a picture of the Turfan countryside, and you, when you drive through, you see this is a brick lattice work, and inside the brick house, they dry raisins, and Turfan raisins are green instead of brown. So when you visit Turfan, people give you bags of green raisins. That's sort of a local trademark. They're also one of the very, when you go to China, you hardly ever see any above ground ruins. And in Turfan, these are, this is the remains of a city that, um, an above ground city that was first built around 500 and then um, occupied to about 1300 when it was abandoned. 
And the, I was just going to say, you can see the city that th this was the ground level. So they built up, they built walls, and then they dug down into the ground because to make cooler houses in the summer. Now, what's preserved in Turfan, or actually next to Turfan, is a graveyard where there was um, thousands of people were buried, and a much looted graveyard. Stein was in Turfan, in the, as I say, in the early 1900s, and when he arrives, he wants to hire someone to help him and tell him which tombs he should excavate. And this guy named Mashik volunteers and says that he and his father have been grave robbers for their entire lives, and he knows everything in the Turfan site. And he's developed a unique technique for finding coins, the silver coins that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture, the Sasanian silver coins. His unique technique is breaking open the jaws of the dead because the um, dead often placed, the living placed a silver coin on the tongue of the dead before a burial. These are silk flowers, artificial flowers, that date to about 600. And were ex when they came out of the ground, they were this, the colors were this vivid. They've since faded. And they have a few strands of hair in them. So it seems likely that they were used as a headdress, maybe for a festival to welcome the spring, which is a typical thing in the Iranian world, a big um, festival. There's a lot of, I always want to say petrified, but it's desiccated. Um, this is bread. And you can buy this bread on the streets of Turfan today, but this is from about 600, 600 or 700 Middle Eastern bread. Um, everybody's favorite slide is the wontons and the <laughs> jiaozi that are from six or 700. Um, again, buried as food for the dead in their next lives. Uh, now, Stein was a very methodical person. He did not excavate using modern archaeological techniques. Uh, he rewarded his men if they found anything particularly valuable. So that encouraged more sort of rapid digging than careful scientific excavation. But when people, his diggers found things, Stein was meticulous about recording them. And this is one of many pages in his archaeological reports showing things he found in this graveyard at, at um, Turfan. This is a paper hat and a paper banner that unrolls. And then these are all, this is a paper cutout and then paper shoes here. And the people of Turfan buried their dead using these paper clothing. They probably did this in other parts of China and the local climate just is not dry enough to preserve these materials. If you look here, you'll see that there are some characters and here's a, detail um, of a shoe, a shoe for the dead with writing inside it. So this is a great example of a non-intentional source, right? People want to make shoes for the dead. Paper costs enough that they choose to recycle paper, recycle something that has writing on it rather than use new paper. Uh, but it doesn't matter to them what they use. And then the archeologists who've worked on these materials disassembled the shoes, and you can see here the needle marks from the edge of the shoe, and then the right. So this is two different shoe soles, right? The toes here and the toes there. And um, this is an order to, um, an, a royal order to buy an orchard. Uh, a lot of the Turfan documents have these kinds of missing gaps in the text. And so um, sometimes the things you most want to know don't survive. The, um, this is the rare example of a deliberately uh, preserved document, an intentionally preserved document that was placed in the ground. One person was buried with 14 contracts. This is the full text of a contract for the loan of money. And this is the name of the person lending the money. And then this is the person who borrowed the money. And he drew these three lines are what you draw, the equivalent in the West would be an X. You're drawing your finger joints, you're signing, um, you're, you draw your finger joints if you can't sign your name. And so this um, man, the, his living kin, buried 14 contracts in his tomb. And 
I think the most credible explanation for why they did that was that they thought he needed these contracts in the next world. And oh, sorry, they're loan contracts. If the person who borrowed the money had paid it back, they would the money. This, he lent money to a lot of people. He would have ripped up the contract. That would have been the end of the transaction. Since he takes these contracts to the next world, we know that he hasn't succeeded in collecting on them in this world. And so I believe that his hope is to sue the people who didn't yet pay him back in the courts of the underworld. And we actually have to refund documents about those courts. This is a very pervasive Chinese belief about the ability to attain justice in the next world if you've been unable to attain it in this world. Okay, this is, you can see this was the catalog of a museum exhibit, um, a ca exhibition catalog at the Met. Um, I, I was gonna say, here's a, sh <coughs> sorry, let me have a sip of water. Um, a sharper picture of her. She's from Turfan, and the people on the Met, when she came to New York, they all called her Tong Barbie, because she's the same dimensions as a, as a Barbie doll. She's, I mean, and um, her outfit is sort of the peak of Silk Road fashion because this is an Iranian motif called a pearl roundel. It's got a, pearls around a circle. And then inside is, I think, a bird. And then this is a Chinese, this was Chinese fashion at the time. She's also around 600 or 700 of a striped skirt. And then she's got a gauze overlay. Now, her hands, if you'll look closely, you'll see she doesn't have fingers because her arms are made out of one piece of paper that was twisted and then put over her back to make the arms. And when archaeologists dismantled, they didn't ask, dismantle her, they dismantled another figurine in the tomb. Um, they found these documents and then here's the transcription. These are pawn slips. So they were, people came and somebody put, put um, this is a cubit of silk a cubit and four feet of silk, their name, the date, they got 120 coins, they signed their name. That month, they brought it back, they redeemed the loan. And this is their address, their address there and their age, a kind of short address. Uh, and then the cross mark is the sign that they redeemed the pawn ticket, they made good on the loan. The um, Chinese historians, there's a scholar in Wuhan named Chen Guotan, and he's worked on those addresses and established that everybody who borrowed money at this pawn shop did so not from Turfan, but in the Chinese capital, in the Tang capital of Chang'an. Mm -hmm. So the figurine, and, and they lived in the neighborhood of a Guanyin um, monastery. Many of the addresses mention this monastery. So then you think, did the woman, uh, was she made, was the figurine made in Chang'an using these recycled pawn tickets? That's, I think, what most people think, because she's so beautiful, it seems likely she was made by very high level artisans. But maybe they exported the used paper to Turfan and she was made in Turfan. Uh, so um, we can tell from the Turfan materials that paper is very widespread. Clearly, the, the, it's become the writing material of choice. and. There may have been a market in used paper, depending on whether you think that woman was made in Chang'an or Turfan. If we read the Turfan documents, we can see that the economy, like at, as at Nia, was initially a, a subsistence economy. Then around 580, silver coins come in from the Iranian world, and people start using them a lot. And then, uh, I was going to say in 640, I should have told you this, but the Tang dynasty invades Turfan and starts to govern Turfan. And people still use those Iranian coins. And then in 700, maybe because the supply of the Iranian uh, Sasanians have fallen to the caliphate, um, so maybe for political reasons, but we're not really sure why, they switch to using Chinese coins. Um, now I want to just go very briefly to a few places in outside of China uh, and uh, in the former Soviet Union. So th what on the map says here is Sagdiana, the home of the Sagdians, is Samarkand in Uzbekistan. And then I'll also talk about this place in the Caucasus Mountains called Mushtravaya Balka. Uh, the, this is a picture of the Mount Moog site. And 
This is the only place, so we have evidence of the Sogdians in China, all kinds of evidence, but very little evidence from their homeland because it's not as dry, not as many things are preserved. But there's one group of documents that were found at this site. And there are fewer than 100 documents. Uh, most of them are in Sogdian, a fewer in Chinese. And um, one of them was written uh, in, it gives us the address and the date in 706. And then it had traveled by about 720 and had traveled to the region outside of Samarkand. And that's the document, sort of a, a, it's a, a, this is a photo from the 1930s when the Soviets did their excavation. But um, this paper has writing on one side and then the back is blank. And I think it's most likely that the local ruler was using the paper, the, the, the discarded Chinese paper as stationary because the, his writing material in the year 700 um, is still, the predominant writing material is leather and um, scraped leather. And the Chinese paper is uh, much lighter and more elegant. So even though it has writing on the back, they just turned it over and used the, his intent was to use the front side, but he didn't. Um, he, it was found that all the Mount Mu documents were placed together in a basket for safekeeping. And again, only discovered um, in the beginning of the 20th century by a group of kids who were playing in the mountains. Um, the, uh, so, and now just to go to Mashchavaya Balka. Um, this, so, I, I was going to say that it's the farthest location from China where paper with Chinese writing has been found in the first millennium, right? <laughs> we could, any of us could buy a Chinese newspaper, maybe not in Williamstown, but. Uh, and uh, there's um, a painting was found there, just a fragment of a painting, of a silk painting. You, you can see, at least those of you in the front row, maybe this three people can see, there's a horse, the head of a horse, and a man, probably, we don't know, but probably the Buddha leaving his palace. And um, in this same site, they found a few scraps of paper that have writing on them. And this one um, is a list of accounts um, of money spent uh, on different things, including for meat. So th um, this is, uh, we can see paper moving out of China into Central Asia. There are uh, some, there's a, a legend that some Chinese are, paper makers are taken captive in a battle in 750, and they bring the secret of, bringing, of making Chinese paper to the Islamic world. That may have happened, but this paper wasn't that hard to make. So the, the technology for making paper of pounding fibers and laying them on a screen is just gradually moving outward from China into um, Central Asia. And by 800, there are paper factories in, um, in Baghdad. Uh, so um, now is the uh, last part of the lecture. It's just about Dunhuang, which is right next to Xuanquan, that first site I was telling you about. And um, the Dunhuang is the Silk Road site with the largest amount of material about f at least 40,000 documents were found in the Dunhuang cave, 20,000 in Chinese, 20,000 in Tibetan. It just dwarfs the scope of anything else found um, on the Silk Road. And um, this is a picture that Stein took. This library cave was in here. This is actually a doctored photo. These, he transposed these shots of these scrolls here from a different photograph onto this um, cave here. The, uh, and this is a, some of the documents that he found were in very neat bundles of their, and they're cataloged. This is like a call number on the outside of this package saying which category of Buddhist text they were. But the Dunhuang cave contained a lot of other materials, sometimes on the back of Buddhist texts, sometimes on scraps of material just a huge amount of material that's both secular and also religious. And one of the most informative documents we have about the Silk Road trade is about a shipment of silk that the central government sent up to the region near, not, not to um, Dunhuang, 
but to Lianzhou, a place so 700 kilometers east of Dunhuang. And the Tang government collected taxes in silk. That's part of using silk as money, was you could pay your taxes in silk. You could weave your own silk. And the, um, they sent this huge shipment of silk up to their troops. The Tang dynasty is stationed um, many troops in the Northwest to um, control the region and keep non, I was gonna say their enemies um, away. I mean, I can tell you more about that in the Q&A if you're interested. What's interesting about this list of the textiles is that it's so incredibly detailed. There are different kinds of silk. So they write down the quantities of the different silk, but they also have things like this, I mean, 4,361 bolts of silk, and then they measure it down to the inch. So there's, it's um, the level of information about the payment going out to the army is just so specific. When the silk arrived um, on site, then the local officials took it to the market and exchanged it for grain, because that's what they needed. They, they kept some of it for uniforms, they exchanged some of it for grain, and they paid the soldiers with the silk. So when we talk about the wealth of the Silk Road, one of the things that's going on is the Chinese government is paying its soldiers who are stationed in Central Asia. The, um, and we have documentary evidence, not from the Silk Road, but from the official histories about the extent of these payments. And there was a rebellion in China in 755, and one of the immediate effects was the central government stops making those payments. So if you want to think of the, a typical Silk Road transaction, that's one I want you to think of, is the, just the Tang government sending thousands and thousands of bolts of silk up to support its armies. Uh, and the um, other thing after 755 is that their um, coins completely disappear. It's an economy that functions only by exchanging silk and some other textiles. Cotton is coming in, wools are coming in, uh, and grain. And even though nobody has any coins, everybody has paper. Paper has become totally widespread and available. Uh, and one of the other documents in the Dunhuang Caves in a language, the Sogdians are gradually giving up their own language and starting to speak the language we now call Uyghur. And so uh, there's a group of documents in this transition language from Sogdian to Uyghur called Turco-Sogdian. And it's about one man who travels on a pretty small circuit it's on a triangle about um, 100, 100 kilometers, 60 miles by 60 miles by 30 miles. And he's got plain white cloth and red dyed cloth. And he trades the white cloth with text, local textile producers in order to get red cloth. So that gives you a sense of how the economy worked at this time when there were no coins, that it's basically an exchange economy. Okay. So if the Silk Road was not, um, well, I was going to say, the, uh, somebody at dinner said to me, like, what makes your, your history of the Silk Road new? The, so what's new is the idea that the Silk Road did not, in, did not involve um, lo sorry, long distance, large scale private trade. That there were different kinds of people moving on the Silk Road, and some of them were merchants, but there were also emissaries, there were missionaries, there were artists, and some of these people traded some of the time as they were traveling, but that was not their primary purpose in traveling. The, I think the real significance of the Silk Road is that from the Chinese point of view, it was the first time they learned about another society and really systematically learned about India because they were so interested in Buddhism. And one estimate is that 35,000 new words entered Chinese from Sanskrit. A lot of those words are Buddhist terms, but some of them are just like the word for moment. Uh, and one of the key people in this transfer of learning was a monk named Kumarajiva, and this is a modern statue. No one has any idea what he looked like. He lived around the year 400. Uh, but I think it's a good place to end the lecture with him. This is, he was from Kizil, one of the sites of the Buddhist caves uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, and he translated, he, his father was from India, his mother was from Kucha, he grew up, he knew Sanskrit, he studied Sanskrit, 
He spoke a local language that was related to Sanskrit, and then he learned Chinese late in life, and he headed a translation bureau. And so um, I think that's one of uh, the key things about the Silk Road is that even if there was no well, large-scale, long-distance private trade, people were still moving, and there was lots of exchange of ideas um, and m much cultural interaction. Thank you very much. So, students, have you, have you got your questions for me? Uh, so you were saying that silk was used as a sort of a currency. Mm -hmm. Did that change it? Because it seemed, you know, I think of silk being a luxury good, you know, nowadays. Um, did that change it at all from being, you know, because if it's used as money on basically all levels, um, did that change it from being a luxury good, or or did that because it, 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 people who are, are using it to sell, you know, like farm right. and like land, uh, livestock and all that kind of stuff. Does it change from being a luxury item to being more of sort of this common thing? I, I should have explained that the silk that was used for money was that plain silk. The luxury good continues, uh, but it's measured, when you read about it in the documents, it's measured in individual sheets. So it's not measure, measured in a bolt. It'll be, and sometimes they'll even give you the dimensions of the square of silk. So it continues to be a luxury good, and there are very beautiful silks are woven during this whole period. That um, the, the uh, list of the documents that the army sent up um, is funny because um, some of the things, like the dyed silk was just plain silk, but um, some of the kinds of silk that people gave to the government were, were um, like this silk, I mean, I was going to say all these translations, I was part of a project looking at these as textiles on, the use of textiles as money on the Silk Road. And we had this team of Chinese and foreign scholars trying to figure out how to translate these things. And so this translation of play and weave shi silk, so that's the Chinese, shi silk using threads of varying thickness <laughs> was, well, we just thought, I mean, I'm not arguing this is a great translation. I mean, I, you know, I don't think anybody would say, I want a dress made of silk woven from using threads of varying thickness. But if you see that character and you don't know what it means, you now know what it means, right? So, so that trade, that, the, the production of these luxury silks continued. I'm not just paper made and did it change? It starts off, it starts off made from cloth, from pounded cloth. And one of the explanations goes back maybe to Zhuangzi. There's a story about pounding rat rag sellers. There's a Chinese classic where they talk about a family that pounds rags for a living, and they, have a, they develop a salve that they don't realize how valuable the salve is, and they give it away, and then somebody uses it to save a kingdom and makes a huge fortune. But um, so the, anyway, the earliest paper has a high cloth content, and then gradually they add more wood and like mulberry, mulberry bark was a key element in Chinese paper. I think you mentioned that <coughs> some of the early documents are dated. Yeah. What kind of dating system would they use? Oh, the standard Chinese dating system that the emperor, each emperor when he took the throne name, uh, had a reign period, like you know, the period of great harmony. They would say year four in the period of great harmony. And so those of us who work in Chinese history, we have guides where we can look up year four in the period of Great Harmony and know it's 70 AD. So and that, that system of dating is throughout Eurasia, that um, you, dating by the king's reign, the year in the king's reign. Yeah. Could, could you tell us more about the Sogdians, when they emerge historically, and when they disappear, and how many of them are there, and how they function? <laughs> well, if you are curious about this, there is a wonderful book to read by Etienne de la Vesser, uh, translated into English, called Sagdi and Merchants. The, the old explanation was th that they really appear on the historical record with that mailbag, with those eight letters. Since then, um, there's been some clay tablets that have some evidence of Sagdi and that just like a few letters 
so that seem to, based on the shape of the letters, Nicholas Sims Williams, who's the guy who knows the most about this, uh, he dates them ahead of the, these letters. So, um, oh, and I was, I was going to say the Sogdians are famous because Alexander the Great fights them, right, with Roxanne. He marries Roxanne, and then he fights the Sogdians. They, they offer such ferocious resistance to him. So we know they exist from the third century BC. They fade from the historical record around the year 1000, and they become Uyghur. They're absorbed into the Uyghur population, and it is possible this is just a natural thing that's happening. One of the Anlushan rebellion, the leader of the rebellion is half Sogdian and half Turkish, and um, there's a lot of, some sources describe anti-Sogdian feeling, so some people think that the Sogdians go underground at that point. How many there are? No. Nobody has any idea. There's not, no, no population figures. I mean, several thousand, but does the several thousand go into tens of thousands? I don't know. So this, this popular notion of, of, of um, thousands of miles being traveled by private, for-profit merchants with caravans of camels and tents, and, right. um, it's very minimized, or, or, or not existent. Well, I was going to say, so I thought you were going to say to me, where does it come from? And I can't answer that question, but that is a really good question. And there is, there is someone named Tamara Chin who's writing about that. Uh, that um, I, I will say, I think a lot of my colleagues are skeptical about my view, but they, they, even the people who continue to believe in the trade say, okay, it, it isn't documented. We just don't see it in the documents. And, and that's... Now, and then they, there you can come up with explanations. Well, the trade could have existed, but it's not documented. Um, but I tend to think we see, we have a lot of information in these documents. If there was huge trade, we would know about it. So, yeah. What was the writing utensil used for the Chinese characters at this time? Right. Well, sometimes a brush, but sometimes just a stick. Yeah. Um. Students, you're not? What was the plain silk used for if it wasn't used for luxury clothing? Well, sorry, the plain silk was used for currency, but then if you needed to make a piece of clothing, you could just cut up your money. I mean, and, and no, and, and people did that. You know, we I mean, we have we have uh, accounts from officials that the guy who lent the who was buried with the contracts. One of the documents in his tomb is an account of how he spent money. He was a soldier. And he's like, I went here and I spent this much silk on this, and I spent this much silk on this. Oh, and then I needed some clothes, so I cut up the silk and I made a suit. So, um, so you could always use plain silk to make things. Um. Um, how, how was all the these people uh, fed? It seemed like there were quite many uh, fairly populous cities, towns. There, well, it's a, I, there, it, I, I should probably have said more about this. Each of these places is an oasis, and, and very, now when you travel, you know, if you fly over this region, it looks so dry, and then you come in someplace, and when you're driving too, you see these deep green poplar, poplar trees, you think, oh, I'm getting, I'm close to an oasis. So the, it was oasis agriculture, and then they had very sophisticated irrigation techniques to try to grow things. Um, the population was never that high. I mean, I, I, should, uh, I should be able to tell you, but like Turfan, Turfan has around 40,000 people. So compared with the Chinese capital, that has a million. You know, the, the, none, none of the cities is that big. But the, and then the soldiers are also eating local grain. You mentioned the, the loan contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the, the, the mode by which the lender made a profit? How did they determine that? Oh, they, they specify the interest. And the Chinese government limited interest to 6 or 7% a month. A month? Uh, but the turf on contracts all charge 10% a month. <laughs> and, this, and, and this would be no existing. Silk that they were dealing with, then it would be that percentage additional silk. Is that 
Yes, and I mean, the, yes, and then, but there was the, the different currencies were exchangeable. Sometimes people say, I don't have any silk, but I can pay you in grain. I don't have any silk, but I can pay you in coins. And they know the values, the exchange values. Yeah. Where did most of Stein's artifacts end up? Well, three-fifths three -fifths should be in Britain and two-fifths should be in India. Uh, he published everything. And I was going to say, one time I went to a conference in Budapest and there was a Hungarian, young Hungarian scholar talking about Stein's writing in Hungarian, very long and scientific presentation. And then all the non-Hungarian speakers, including me, are like, did he ever write anything on Hungarian that he didn't write first in English? The scholar said, no, and we're all like, phew. <laughs> so so um, Stein published everything. Then when things were split between, because the government of India was his sponsor, so the, and they paid for his expeditions. So things were split between Britain and India, and then the things that went to Britain have been divided into different places. So they're in the British Library and the British Museum. The things in, in, in India are in the Delhi Museum, but not as well cataloged as in um, Britain. So that's sort of one of the areas that maybe people will be doing work on in the future, tracking those things down. There's a question in the back. Yes. Were, were any wounds sent? Hmm. Certainly pictures of looms, but I don't remember any looms. There's a museum in Hangzhou, the Silk Museum, where they've done a lot of reconstructions of looms and, and, and trying to figure things out. But, I, but, I, but I'm not the person who would remember. So it, they may have been found and I just don't remember. This looks like a pretty big shipment to me. Yes, absolutely. How many mules had to be fed and watered uh, when this arrived in a, one of those towns? Hmm. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I can't remember. The document is very long. It might actually tell us that, but um, probably several hundred. Maybe that was a limiting factor, too, in the size and also the number of people in old Khotan. Right. It would have been so small. It's not much of a market. Well, they had a big, the government had a big issue staffing these mule trains. And originally they wanted, they tried to, but it's funny, they, they wanted to do it themselves, and then they end up having to outsource. <laughs> just like, let, you know, you, you handle that. You, you just, you, you, and, and, and I think the Sogdi, sometimes they look to the Sogdi and merchants. You guys, get, get the silk up there. We can't handle it. Yeah. The, the, period, the period when coins bought, does that correspond with political change or political instability? It's the, it's the after the Anlushan Rebellion, and so the um, central Chinese government is trying to put down this rebellion in central China, and they just can't pay their troops. And I think that's one of the key factors in the drying up of the coins in this region. So the name, the, the Silk Road, is that a completely European construction? I mean, was it referred to at all or to Europe? No. So this trade route, I mean, were there other trade routes? Is it just because it was dry and terrifying we have all this evidence that we know about those locales, but maybe there were trade routes elsewhere that we don't know about? I mean, uh, there's always a moment when I give this talk when people say to me, what about the things that haven't been discovered yet? <laughs> so, so sometimes I remember when I give the talk to say in the middle, I only want to talk about what has been discovered so far. Um, basically, the map of Eurasia, if you, any, anybody who's an expert in any specific region will draw multiple routes, multiple trade routes that people are moving on. Uh, and, but nobody in any of those, nobody ever uses the word Silk Road, historically, in any language, not Chinese or the other languages. The, um, is there, and, and the level of preservation in Turfan is higher than for other places. You know, I guess you could say that, well, I was about to say, so there's, tra there's always local trade everywhere. I guess that's what I would say. There's local trade everywhere, but I'm pretty confident that there's not massive long distance trade any place. I mean, even if with the different problems we have of preservation. To what extent does it matter whether or not there's a long distance trade? In the sense that 
you could imagine an organization of the trade in which each community brought the product to the border with the next community and handed it on for reasons of security and reasons of trust and things like that. And so the movement of goods might be no different than if it had been a single individual bringing it from point A directly to point C. Then it would be if you had 26 individuals bringing it from point A to point C. And well, the reason it matters is that if one person travels the whole way, then there's a lot of cultural interaction. If everybody just stays put and goes to the edge of, you know, if the people in Williamstown just go to North Adams and trade at that border and then come back, they haven't, they haven't learned anything. They've just had contact with, and the goods, are, the goods might be moving, and there's definitely a trickle trade. You know, some of these goods are, like those pearls, I mean, I'm not saying somebody from Sri Lanka carried the pearls up to Nia, right? But so, and, and the envoys are, when they bring gifts, one of the things they do, they spy on each other. They, they travel to visit a king. They carry a letter from their king to the other ruler. They spy on the ruler they're visiting. Then they go home and they tell their king what they saw. But they also take presents to the ruler they're visiting. And they're constantly re-gifting. So, you know, you have, people, you have people like in the middle of Central Asia, you know, like the, in, in, you know, in, in um, these, this part of the world are giving coral, you know, a coral tree. What do you mean, a coral tree? Where did that come from? So, um, the, there, and actually we do know about some people, the funny thing is when you look at the written record, we do know about people, some, some people going a long distance. There are some missionaries that go all the way from China to India as individuals and write about it. Uh, but the, I, I take your point in the sense of, but it matters if you start off thinking that the Romans used coins to buy silk. Uh, and then you say, gee, no, there's no Roman money in China. And there just doesn't, I really don't think there was any contact between China and Rome. So, so you know, that, that, it matters in the sense of cultural contact and cultural influence. Well, not necessarily transmission of knowledge. In the sense that, again, you could have transmission of knowledge taking place through a kind of a process of osmosis almost, community to community to community. Yeah, if you had, like, if everybody had, you know, iPads armed with Google Translator, I, I mean, you just have problems with. I take your point, but it's, it, it's certainly a different kind of cultural exchange than if you have people traveling long distance. Well, one, one point to keep in mind there, following up on your point, is that you have technological exchange of knowledge, but you don't have the kind of exchange of knowledge you have, say, when the Jesuits start going from Europe to China and back and bringing information about political systems, philosophical systems, writing systems. So the technology moves in the earlier period when people are going from spot to spot. But you don't have the awareness in Europe of Chinese culture. And you don't have the awareness in China of European culture that you get when later on you have individuals who make that entire journey. And I think that's a, a meaningful distinction. You don't have Europeans knowing about uh, Chinese bureaucratic systems until you have the uh, until you have the Jesuits. Nobody says you have Marco Polo. But I think Marco Polo is one of, I mean, I, for years I was very skeptical about Marco Polo. There's a series of recent publications that are making me change my mind. But um, even if Marco Polo did not go everywhere he claimed to have gone, he writes about China in a way that people in Europe know about. What was the origin of mules? Camels are good for the desert, and mules are good on dirt roads. Hmm. I just don't, I've, they're all, I've, they're, I've always been around in my sources. I don't know when they, they come from. Just yeah. to follow up on that, how about the interest in forces, especially from inner Central Asia, uh -huh. uh, by the Chinese government in this period? This, I was going to say, this period is a little early. Later on, the Chinese are really interested in Central Asian horses. The Tang Dynasty has 
enough Turkic background that the horse is not a, they have no problem sourcing horses. Um, is that what you? No, so they come later. Yeah. The, the envoy is going to uh, the higher planes and trying to buy and, and trying to buy horses, yeah. That's, that's later? Yeah. Part of it has to do with terrain that the Tang control a lot of the Northwest, and so they can get horses. It's when the, like the Sung is contracting, especially the Southern Sung, and it's just, you can't, you, I mean, the Chinese buy horses, and then when they start raising them in the South China, the horses, each generation gets smaller and smaller. <laughs> Yeah. We actually decided to ask questions now. Um, <laughs> Good. So I was thinking back to when you were saying uh, with the silks that you could be trading at different, like you could get so many silks for so many cloths, for right. so many felts, for so many grains. Was there um, some sort of, and especially because the governments were giving out to their soldiers, is there any way we know of like a standardized exchange rate or would there be like, Sometimes. Or, or is it all based on just individual barter? Or, I mean, because if you run with an agricultural bad year, then your silk isn't going to be worth as much. Oh, right. There are, we don't have documents about all the exchange rates, but people at the time had exchange rates, and they did change. As you say, if, there was, if grain was in short supply, mm -hmm. or the coins were in short, short supply, those ratios could be adjusted. But occasionally someone will say, oh, this year, a bolt of silk is worth this much in coins. And then we think, OK, most of the time they had that kind of figure in their head. We just, they don't always write it down, or it doesn't always survive. Um, when you were talking about quite ancient and very, can you talk more about like, what happened to that area, say, in the last century or a bit later than what you but the, but, I mean, the, uh, I was going to say, the region is, it's kind of, when the Chinese state is strong, it can control, control Xinjiang. So in the middle of the 19th century, it, it basically is getting, the Chinese state is getting weaker. They're losing control of Xinjiang. Xinjiang is partially independent. The British and the Russians are looking at Xinjiang thinking it would be a great place to control good buffer state near Afghanistan. Uh, they, um, it becomes, uh, basically a, a satellite of the Soviet Union, a sphere of influence of the Soviet Union. And then in 1949, when the Chinese, the People's Republic is founded, the lead warlord in Xinjiang joins the communists, and Xinjiang joins China. But even then, it's under Russian control. There's this secret treaty that's only published after 1989, where the Chinese give the Russians extraterritoriality. Any Russian who commits a crime will be tried in Russian courts. So um, the people who live there now are called the Uyghurs, and their ancestors are some of the people writing these documents. Um, so, um, sorry, my question is more um, about like, how was meant to be more about how, so the Silk Road trade, um, as you presented, like, so it, did it die out, or? Oh, I, I was going to say the, if you believe the stock, if you, the usual model is there was this period of great long distance trade and then it dies out because of the, sea, the rise of the sea trade is the way people usually describe it. But the um, way that you see it is that there won't be such long distance trade. But I, I don't see that much change. So I think there's always local trade. I think it, the local trade continues. I don't think the sea trade has that big an impact okay. on, the, on the region. Since the governments were using silk to make all the purchases and pay all their workers. Did they in any way control the production of silk? People paid their taxes in silk. They're collecting taxes in silk. Um, you mentioned it's at least early on paper was made partly from mulberry bark. So mm -hmm. is there a tie between silk production and paper production at some point? A tie? Oh, that's interesting. I don't, I, I, I mean, you could, I think you could, um, I don't think people made paper from mulberry leaves, so they were feeding the silkworms with the leaves and using the bark for the paper. But I, I, I could be wrong. Could you sort of like the owner of the plantation, could they be turning out two products is what I meant. Yeah. I think we should stop. Well, 
Thank you.